Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Upcycle Embellishment Workshop with Ali Rennert from the Untrend Shop. I'm Noor Bashara from Upcycle Design School, and I've been hosting these workshops every month. And the last few were pretty successful, so I'm excited to be hosting Ali, and she's going to be talking about her brand story about the Untrend Shop, how she started, and what she does for the embellishments that she uses on her pieces. And she's gonna talk through that process. So Ali, I will let you take it from here. Hey guys, I'm Ali. Um, like Nora said, my brand is called The Untrend Shop. Um, the concept of the word untrend for me is about going against like the norm or like not necessarily against, but just not conforming to what fashion is supposed to be or what the trends are and just kind of owning your own personal style. And so with that, a lot of the things that I create are kind of like crazy, bold styles and patterns and um, prints. So um, primarily what I do is upcycle. So I've kind of put a focus on denim just because I kind of got into denim and doing repair work and then was really just it fell in love with that fabric and how many different ways it can be transformed and used. So I use denim garments and I either reconstruct them and make new things or I adorn pieces that are kind of old tired denim pieces. So some of the techniques that I use to do this are painting, um, applique and reverse applique, chain stitch embroidery, um, fringing, distressing, patching, all sorts of different things. But um, today we're going to focus on first doing a little bit of painting and showing you guys the kind of proper way to apply paint to denim, but also to any fabric and clothing. And then um, we're going to do a little bit of reverse applique and applique work. And then I'll show you guys an example of how you can bring that to a real garment. I have one here that I've done. And then um, after that, I'm gonna show you guys my chain stitch embroidery machine and just kind of show you guys the way that machine works and how I use it. Uh, that's not really something like you can do at home by hand, but it's just kind of an interesting piece of what I do. And I think it would be cool to show you guys that. And then from there, we'll just take questions. So if you guys want to know anything else about denim, how to do certain types of patchwork, fringing, distressing, any of that stuff, that's my expertise. So we'll just start with what I want to show you guys and then go from there if you have questions about anything else. Um, and also a quick, just like little background too. I, I got into all of this because I worked in corporate fashion for a little over a year as a designer. And I not only saw all of the waste that's produced, but kind of felt uninspired by the industry mm -hmm. and just um, feeling like it was a lot of just copying and not a lot of originality. And so I, I wanted to get out of that and get back into the maker side of things and was really inspired to do that in a more sustainable way. So that's how I got into all of this and I've been doing this for a couple of years now. So yeah, um, so I'm gonna switch my camera to be up here on the tripod so that you guys can see exactly what I'm doing. So just give me a, a quick minute to do that. And also, Ali, do you want to tell everyone where you are also? Oh, yes, that's important. <laughs> um, so probably also about, uh, I guess, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, I started working with a brand called Canvas. And um, they are uh, a few different stores and also an online store now that focuses on bringing in brands and designers that are either doing things sustainably or ethically or locally. They focus on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So all the brands have to meet at least one of those goals. And really, it's just uh, stores that have brought together a group of different individual designers and companies that are focused all on the same thing. So I am now actually set up at the new store on Bowery with my embroidery machine. And I'm gonna be offering that service to our customers here and also working with other brands in the store to add embroidery to their product. So that's where I am today. I don't know if I can like show you guys a little bit, but this is the store. 
it's a huge gallery space. So there's actually a whole back area as well. Um, and there is actually a uh, art show that's getting set up and starting this weekend. Um, so it's gonna be open, the store is open on, well, yeah, all weekend, um, 12 to six. So if anyone wants to come by and see the art show and the store, I'll be here as well on the weekend. So yeah, that sums it up. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna switch my camera. Okay, you guys can see me here now, right? Yeah, it's working. Okay, awesome. <laughs> okay, I'm just getting the angles set up. Okay. All right, how does that look? Everything good? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, so this is a jacket that I actually prepped ahead of time. Um, and basically one of the things that I like to do is make a blank white canvas as sort of to speak for myself. And then I can use paint markers to draw on this. Um, so I'm going to explain really quick just how I did this. I didn't want to do the whole entire process here, but because um, it takes a little bit of drying. But basically, um, you don't necessarily need to use these extra mediums when you're painting on clothes. But what I found is that it helps with the texture of the clothing and that it also is something that's going to last longer, which is ultimately the goal. So. Um, what I first do, and I actually, I'm gonna do a little bit on a sample here, is I use this stuff called matte medium. And this is basically a clear paint, acrylic paint, that kind of sets the surface so that when you're painting on the denim or on the fabric, you're not getting um, kind of that fiber texture. This just smooths everything out and makes it so that it's the colors that you end up putting on top of this are so much brighter. So I'm gonna paint a little bit on here. And then real quick, this is something else that I use with anything that I paint, whether it's the medium or the actual paint. And this is a heat set fabric paint and it's, it's really like liquidy so you don't have to dilute the paints also with water you can just use this instead and we're going to post all of these um after the workshop too we'll send you guys the information of what these are but basically i'm just going to mix these two together to create my surface and then because this is a heat set then i'm going to take my iron and actually iron over it and that's going to fuse those fibers together so that it makes it a nice surface to paint on So if you're using a, a, if you're like gonna make this big of a space, then you can use a larger paintbrush to do it. But as you guys can see, I'm painting this on and it's kind of white at first, but then it's clear. So this is just anytime I'm gonna paint on denim, even if I'm not gonna make a white paint surface first, I am always gonna do this because I'll show you guys the difference of putting a paint marker on top of this versus on top of fabric that isn't prepped. And the difference in the color is just um, pretty significant. Okay. 
And then typically I would let that dry a little bit longer first, but since I just wanna show you guys, I'm gonna use a press cloth. Anytime I'm ironing out anything I'm doing, um, I don't wanna get the uh, paint or anything on my iron. So I'm just gonna put a press cloth down and actually do that. And make sure also that the press cloth that you use isn't going to leave little pieces of fiber on the fabric. Okay. So that's still gonna need a little bit to dry, but basically, what I'm gonna use is these paint markers. There's tons of different brands. I've found that most of them are great. I really like this brand. Um, and this is just like a way to get a lot more control when you're painting um, versus a paintbrush. But see when I put it on this, you can see it, but you're still gonna have that kind of like denim texture and it's, you're gonna have to do more layers of this in order to make it stand out and make it stay versus when you put the medium on first and then I'm gonna draw on top of that in a minute. I'll show you guys kind of the difference and how much brighter it looks and how you really only have to go over it maybe once or twice versus um, a bunch of different times. All right, but um, while we wait for that to dry, I'm just gonna move into this area and show you guys a little bit of how I go about it. Uh, so this just makes it so that it's just really nice and easy to do anything I possibly want to do on here. And if you don't feel comfortable drawing yourself or writing yourself, you can always print out something and create a stencil um, by cutting it out of the paper and put that down and kind of use that to paint. Um, but really you can't go wrong. It's, it's all based on your creativity and what you want it to look like. Uh, I'm actually going to create a jacket that I have done before, which is um, a bunch of different like crazy lettering of the words. Um, it's all in my head. Is it all in my head? Um, it's kind of like this psychological jacket that when you look at it, it's all crazy. But then you start to read what it says and it's like, wondering if, if your ideas are just crazy or if they're actually legitimate ideas. I think that's something as an artist we just struggle with a lot. So that's my, was my concept in creating this jacket, but I'll just show you guys, I'll get started and show you guys how it turns out. So yeah, you can see how bright that turns out. And from there, I'm just going to, um, I'll do one more line so you can kind of see my concept.
Okay. Yeah. And when I do it, I honestly just go for it. I think that you should just kind of trust what you want it to look like and just kind of like use creative expression. And really from here, I'm just going to keep going with these words all the way down. And that creates the entire concept of um, kind of questioning yourself as an artist. <laughs> so let's go back to this and see that's a little bit more dry now. But you'll be able to see it better when it's dry, but see how, and I know this is a little darker, it will dry clear, but really just like one stroke of the paint pen comes out so much brighter because this surface has already been like prepped and fused. So. Yeah, it's really um, an awesome way to get a brighter motif on your clothes. Um, I think with hand painting, that's really all I want to show you guys today. Um, there's obviously more ways besides the markers to do it. Um, I also have in, like paints like this and I have an entire little set of a bunch of different colors and I have a much more fine paintbrush. So sometimes I'll just go in and do like actual painting if you feel comfortable. But I think the markers are a really great way to create something cool. You have a ton of control and now you know how to do it in a way that um, is fabric friendly. So unless anyone has questions on that portion, I will move on to the applique part of things. Oh, there's a chat. Oh, that's you, Nora. okay. Have you, okay. have you found that this painting technique is washable on the garment? Yes. Yes. Um, so that's why I use this stuff because it's heat setting the paint to the fabric. So I would still say for most denim garments anyway that are like that have anything like this on it, it's better off to just wash it like hand wash it yourself, <laughs> but um, not just like throw in the wash with all your clothes. But yeah, that's, it can definitely still put it through the machine, um, probably by itself, but I would suggest hand washing, but yes, this is, makes it so that it's going to last through washes much better. I, I have a quick question. I yeah. noticed that your edges are not sharp white edges. Is that on purpose? The way yeah. that you did it? Okay. Yeah, um, because this concept is kind of like the chaoticness of what's in your head, I wanted it to be like splashy. <laughs> so um, you can like put tape down along the edges and make it so that it's perfect. But yeah, that was my concept. I wanted it to kind of be um, spongy and blotchy around the edges as I think it looks cool. And okay. Um, that uh, one question to achieve that white, you put the yeah. you put the two layers on first, and then you wait you waited for it to dry, then you pressed it with the iron, then you painted white paint on the whole area. Yes, I did these two together first to make the matte surface, and that makes it so that when you're painting the white on, it just comes out so bright. Um, but also, I use this with the white too. So when I would paint the white paint down. I also dilute it with the fabric heat set um, because you want to iron that first matte medium layer. And then you also want to iron the white layer to fuse that as well before going on with the paint markers. And honestly, you can also take the paint markers and like dip it in this every time if you really want to fuse the whole final thing with um, the paint on the markers as well, but I would say that that part is less necessary. It's still gonna stay. Cool, okay. Anything else before we move on? Good. Okay, so before we start this portion, I am going to show you guys an example of how I use this technique. 
So this is a piece that I'll be selling in the store here. And um, this is just a denim jacket that I thrifted. And then these clouds are all different fabrics. Um, one's like a neoprene, one's a leather. One is like a shiny, um, thinner polyester probably. Um, these are all just like scrap fabrics that I had. And yeah, this is applique, not reverse applique, but um, I just wanna show you guys a way to use applique to really create a whole image or pattern really on your, on your clothing. And uh, this is, um, yeah, this is only on top and this is um, sewn actually with a machine, but I'm gonna show you guys this process and how to just stitch it on by hand. Um, but yeah, when I'm doing a whole jacket, I like to use the zigzag stitch on my home sewing machine because I think that it looks cool and it's also a good way for everything to, to stay on there. So just um, an example first for you guys so you can see why we're learning all this stuff and how you can actually uh, make it really cool. So I'm going to... So I'm gonna use just this pair of jeans. It's all ripped up already <laughs> as an example. And for this one, I'll probably get pretty close to the camera so that you guys can see what I'm actually stitching. Um, and for this one, I'm going to use these like fun embroidery threads to not only so you guys can see exactly what's going on, but also um, these are just craft embroidery thread that you can get at any Notion sewing craft store. And these are awesome for hand stitching because the thread is really strong and it's really bright and beautiful colors. So it gives it uh, kind of a more fun aesthetic. So um, basically I'm gonna show first uh, just like how I sew applique on. So I wanted to give an example of something that I often do, which is if I have a fabric like this and I have patterns on the fabric already, I might just go in and cut out one of these flowers and use that as my applique uh, because it already has imagery to it. So I'm gonna go in and just grab this little black flower here. And so I'm gonna just use that as my applique. Maybe I wanna stitch it like on the jean up here, or you could put it on the back somewhere. These jeans have the back pockets cut out, but on the pocket or really anywhere. This is also an awesome way to patch a hole. So if you have like one of those really annoying tiny holes that's pretty insignificant on your jeans, this is a cool way to like just put that right on top of it and stitch it on. So I'm gonna show you guys how I like to stitch mine on so that it gives it kind of a, a cool look. And also I'm not gonna do that right now because I don't want it to be wet but I brought this to show you guys. Um, this is something I use all the time. <laughs> it's called Fray Check and it's, it makes it so that any piece of denim or woven fabric that I'm gonna stitch onto something else can be sealed on the edges. So what I would do, and I'll just do a little piece of it, is on the very edge of this, you just put like a little bit. Can you guys see what I'm doing? Yeah, just a tiny bit along all the edges. And what that does is it actually fuses the edge of the fabric together. And this is also washable, it's supposed to stay in the wash um, so that this does not continue to get pulled off. And so that all the edges are nice and tight. All right, so I'm gonna stitch it up here. So that's kind of cute. Okay. 
And when I do stitch uh, with this larger embroidery thread, because this is about five threads all in one, usually I'm going to use a larger needle. This needle is kind of excessively large, but I just think it allows you to have more control and it allows you to easily put the embroidery thread through the, um, the hole. Okay, so you guys can kind of see what I'm doing here. Basically, I'm gonna start by poking a hole from the back and then coming up through both the piece that I'm sewing on and the jeans. So I'm starting on the inside basically. And then when I'm gonna go back down into the fabric, I'm going to go straight out with the thread. So, and poke just along the outside edge of the applique piece into the denim. And then where I'm gonna come back up, cause I wanna do this all in one motion. I wanna poke down and then poke right back up, right onto the next spot where I'm going to um, sew the applique down. So I'll do that again, cause I know it's a little bit hard to tell what I'm doing, but basically I just made this line here. And when I came down on the outside, I came right back up on the inside of the applique so that I can go ahead and create that next stitch. And the reason I do it this way is because if you do a bunch of them all like this, especially in different colors, then you're gonna have this really cool vertical stitch kind of like coming out of your piece. And I think it's just really cool to have it be very visible. So I'm gonna make my third mark here by stabbing down into the jean, jean only, and then coming back up with applique and jean. So you guys can kind of see where I'm coming back up. Let me know along the way, if, if anyone has questions about what I'm doing, you wanna see something again, just pull yourself off mute and go ahead and ask. I'm totally open to that. I'm just gonna do a few more and you guys can kind of get the concept. And I can also re-show part of this at the end if anyone needs me to go over it. Um, there will also be a recording of this. So if you guys need to reference it, you can. Um, but yeah, basically now that I have a rhythm, I'm just poking again outside the jean area and then back up through the applique. And there, just in a couple minutes, we've gotten just about halfway through. So I'll show you guys what that looks like when you're done. And you can also vary these stitches. Like you can come all the way out to here if you want like big long stitches coming out of your piece. So that's just kind of a fun way to stitch something down, have it be visible and also show another color. So from there, I'm gonna leave that one because I think that that's decently self-explanatory, but we can review later if we need to. And this next one is actually one that I think is maybe less common and it's gonna be pretty much the reverse of this. So what I call reverse applique. And I'm gonna show a smaller sample of this so that you guys can see it up close, but I'm gonna explain to you how I do bigger pieces like on the back of a jacket if I wanna do a big word or something like that. Um, that's, I'm gonna show you guys how I do that. So um, I've already cut out this from a piece of paper. So I, you can print out a specific font you want, um, but personally I just drew this bubble font and then I cut out, this is all connected. If you're gonna do this technique, it's definitely better to have a word that is in a script font so that this is all one thing that you're cutting out and the U is the only thing that's separate. It's even better if the whole word is connected, but um, yeah. 
So basically what I'm going to do is I already pinned down this paper to the fabric and I usually just jump in with the scissors and go for it, but probably the safest bet on just making sure this is actually going to look good is you can actually go in if you have a pen that works or a Sharpie or even one of those paint markers, you can go in and start to trace around this paper cut out, just keeping it pinned in place nicely. And the reason being is that you're gonna end up cutting off this part that you're coloring anyway. So it's totally fine that you're drawing on the fabric because you can just make sure that that doesn't get isn't visible in your final piece. But I just traced around the U. And so you guys can see that I kind of have a faint outline of what I'm gonna cut out. And that makes it a little bit easier so I'm not messing with the paper all um, pinned down or anything. But from there, I'm just gonna take the fabric scissors and just make an initial cut. And then I'm just gonna go in and cut around just outside of where I made the pen mark like that. Okay, and then there, you're able to see the U, kind of not so much when I hold it up, but um, the best thing about doing this technique with denim is that it really holds its shape. Like it's always gonna kind of come back to when you lay it flat where it's supposed to be. So what I would do next is cut out this entire upcycle word but I'm not gonna spend all the time doing that in front of you guys, just wanted to give you the concept. Um, but basically, now that that's cut out, I'm going to do the opposite of what I just did and put a fabric underneath it for the reverse. So if it's my brand, I'm probably using something like this because I like it to be crazy and bold and that's like a red sequin. But um, for hand stitching, I'm gonna use this other one just so that it's a little bit easier for me to stitch in front of you guys. So I would usually cut out a piece big enough to fit the whole word and then I would pin it in all places behind. And then from there, I actually, when I do this one, I typically do it on the machine because it's just faster and you can just stitch around the whole word. But it's also totally fine to do it by hand. So I'll show you guys kind of the same sort of method of how I do that. And then a quick mention again on the fray check. This is what I would go ahead and put through on the edges of the inside of the denim where I've cut it out before I do this. Especially if you're doing a word, it's gonna start to fray over time. So it's gonna be much better if you fuse the edges so that the word is always clear. So basically, I'm just going to pin around it so I can make sure that that U is really keeping its shape. And then we'll pin on the top and the bottom and then that U is sort of the stress point. So I'll pin in there as well. Sorry guys. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, I'm gonna use the red again, just so you guys can see exactly what I'm doing. I didn't show this part before. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with sewing in general, hand sewing, um, this is a really easy way to knot the end of your uh, of your thread. So what I do is I take it and I loop it around my finger twice, kind of loosely. And then I take my thumb and I just roll that piece and then pull with the other hand and it makes a little knot. That's how I find is the easiest way to knot the back of the of the thread. It probably takes a few tries sometimes, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, and then for this, there's no one point where it's necessarily best to start. You can start wherever on the letter. I'm gonna start just up in this corner here. And um, similar to the other one, I'm going to poke my first needle up through the, um, the inside of the motif, which in this case, I'm only poking it through the applique knot bow. Um, so that is why it's the reverse. So when I come up here, then I'm going to come back down perpendicular to that place I came up. And this is going to be into the jean and the applique piece bow. So poking down there, and then I'm going to come up on the inside where the applique is by itself. And that creates my first stitch. And then you can kind of just continue to do that same thing. Down and then back up. Down there and back up there. And you can be as perfectionist about this as you want. But definitely with hand mending and hand embroidery techniques, the sort of imperfection that comes along with it is what creates its charm, I think. So I don't think it's something where you need to be super, super particular about making sure all of those look the same. See how mine are kind of different. Some are slanted, some are smaller, and that's kind of the beauty of it. Yeah, basically, if I would continue to go around the whole word, then I would be stitching it down to the back. And there's your reverse. Did someone have a question? Sorry, I thought I heard something. <laughs> um, but yeah, that pretty much covers applique and reverse applique. Um, I don't know what, what time is it. I can't see from my... Um, when you when you do the reverse applique, you usually do it on the sewing machine as well. Yeah, I think it's easier for me. Like I'll go through and I'll pin it exactly like that, all the stress points and the top and the bottom. And then it's you're just kind of guiding around the word on the machine. I use just a regular straight stitch for that. Uh, and it just it just goes faster. But this is sort of a way to make it, I mean, I think this looks cooler. <laughs> but it's just much more time consuming. And when you spend more time on something and you're gonna sell it, then you have to think about that and what the difference in, in the look is versus the difference in the cost and if that's worth it to a customer. So that's kind of where my brain is at as far as trying to speed up some of my processes. Does anyone have any questions on those two techniques before I show you guys the embroidery? I do. Yeah. I was interested now, instead of doing a word, could I do a pattern? And instead of sewing the, the denim on, somehow glue it with an adhesive? So if I wanted to do like an Arabic pattern that had some really kind of interesting um, smaller pieces to it, not just a big uh, mm -hmm. letter. Okay, and then I want to lay it down, say, on a gold surface, a gold background. I can't sew that because it's so fine. Okay. 
Could I do it with a light adhesive somehow? I think there are fabric adhesives that you could use. Like you could use a double-sided fusible interfacing, probably. Uh, um, what? <laughs> sorry? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I'm um, brand new to this, so you'll No, have it's to... okay. It depends because I'm not sure exactly what your motif looks like and whether this would show through, but there is something that's a double-sided fusible interfacing. So basically it's a really thin piece of fabric um, that has fusible on both sides, like fusible dots. And then you would just use your regular iron to uh -huh. iron it down, kind of like you would a patch, like an iron-on right. patch. Mm -hmm. They have fabric for that. And not only is there like actual yardage of fabric, but um, they there's also tape like a roll of double-sided fusible tape. Uh, I used to use that a lot when I would stick down like patches or something ahead of time and then go to sew it if it didn't have a backing to it already. So mm -hmm. that's probably the best way for fabric, what I would suggest. I don't know about glue. I don't know <laughs> how long that would last, but um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Anyone else have any questions on this particular technique before we move on? I just want to add to the fusible. Um, so fusible is it's just basically like a little, it's like a um, polyester thin fabric that has a glue on one side generally, and you just iron it on to give the fabric more strength. That's what it's traditionally used for in sewing. But a double-sided fusible would just mean that the glue is on both sides. So then you can use that as a bonding. And there's a store in the garment district in New York called Silthread. I'll put it in the chat also that you can find regular fusible. So if you go there, it's on 38th Street. I'm sure they probably have the double sided as well, or they could help you find it. They also have a website. Yeah, I think they do have double sided there. I actually go there all the freaking time. Um, this is something you can get there too. <laughs> So if they have pretty much all different types of sewing notions. Embroidery thread you can get there as well. Um, yeah. Okay, I think that's it for questions on that, right? So for the next part, I'm going to show you guys basically just how I do the embroidery on my machine. I know it's not really something you can apply at home, but if you do live in the city, you can come visit me here at the canvas. I'll also give the address of that at the end of this and we'll include it on the information that we send you guys so that you know where to find me. Um, before I move to that, I wanna show you guys one other thing. Um, this is a product of kind of like basically the reverse applique that I was showing you guys, but in sections of a garment. So that's another way that you can use that technique is I basically go in and just cut out that section of the denim jacket. And I like to leave about a half inch so I can pull it and so it's nice and frayed. And then I would just take that piece that I cut out and I would use that as a pattern piece to cut out the piece that's gonna replace it. So I take that piece of denim, put it on paper, draw the pattern piece and then add an inch all around for the seam allowance. And this technique works really great with leather because you don't have to finish the edges on the back. So I would just take that piece that I cut out of leather and just stitch it right on the back of it. Um, essentially, it's called like paneling. I'm just replacing that part of the jacket with a different fabric and it's on the reverse. So you can really see the cool frayed denim as a result. And then the same thing on the back. So it's a bigger section and I left pieces of the denim to just kind of add to the texture of it. But essentially I could do the same thing where I would cut out the entire 
back piece and then use that as a pattern piece to sew in a new piece of fabric. So that's another just cool, fun way that you can use the applique reverse applique technique. And also you really could do just, if you don't feel comfortable cutting out from the denim and putting behind, because it is a little bit more difficult, you can just cut a piece of fabric that fits that section and just stitch it right on top of that whole section. So that's another way to do it so that the denim keeps its shape and it's a little bit easier to apply the fabric on top. Can you show us where the seam is? Where the where you, seam? Where, well, where you sewed it, where, where the machine went? Yeah, I use a multicolored denim thread so that you can't really see it. <laughs> um, so these are just the original stitches. You might be able to kind of see. Mm -hmm. I usually stitch right in between those two. Okay. But yeah, it's hard to see because this is, I usually work with stone wash or acid wash denim just because it's what I'm initially attracted to. And I have that denim thread so that the stitching that I apply is really invisible. Okay, cool. Thank yeah. you. Of course. All right, guys. And then... I want to show you a piece that I did using the embroidery machine and then I'll hop over there and just show you guys how it works. But um, these are just a bunch of cute little mouths <laughs> on a pair of shorts. So I'll, um, I'll show you guys the machine and I'll, I'll do a, a small motif so you can see how that works. Okay, so I'm gonna just make sure that I'm set up over here. Um, so this is a vintage uh, Singer chain stitch embroidery machine and it looks all bright and new because I had it refurbished and then I had someone paint it for me. And so traditionally the machines are usually painted black and uh, look a little bit more vintage, but it is about a hundred years old, this machine. Okay. Sorry about that. So there is a crank underneath the machine. That is how I control the direction of the stitch. See if I can get you guys just a little bit more behind me here so you can see I know what I'm doing. Okay. So this is the crank right here. And it's just a handle that I'm just moving around and it moves this mechanism in here so that uh, I can see what direction the stitch is moving at all times. And give me one sec, because I'm going to bring you guys around to the other side so it's a little easier to see. Okay, there we go. So this is a skirt that I am working on and ahead of time, I just, basically I drew out all these little uh, graffiti faces on tracing paper. So as you can see, some of them still have the paper in it. And then I go in and I do my initial outline stitch and then that's when I can actually go and tear the paper out and then continue to fill in. So I just want to kind of show you guys how this machine works. And the type of stitch that I'm going to do is this kind of fuzzy stitch. 
the um, traditional setting of this machine is this chain stitch. And then this is the like reverse of the, of the setting. So it's kind of like a varsity patch. If anyone also has questions while I kind of get this set up, go ahead and ask them now. What was the chain stitch machine originally used for? So there's a little bit of history behind this machine, actually. Um, well, of course, since it's 100 years old. And um, the person who discovered or kind of made the first prototype of this was this guy in France. And that was in, I believe, the 1860s. And it wasn't actually brought to market and produced uh, until maybe, I think, 50 years later. So it was first developed and kind of used then, but then brought to market later. And the reason was um, that once people started being able to afford to go out and buy their clothes more than just making them at home, because traditionally people would just do hand embroidery at home on their garments. Um, once it, it, people wanted to buy from stores, that's when this really came into popularity because this became the standard for embroidery uh, because it looks like hand embroidery, but it's done on a machine and it's still hand cranked. So there's still no computers involved. And this was really popular and such a standard for workwear, um, for a lot of Western wear and anything you see traditional old embroidery on, it was probably done on a machine like this. So the reason why also it, it kind of fell out of popularity was from the invention of computerized embroidery. And people just said, well, we don't need this. It takes too long compared to that. <laughs> um, but in the past maybe 15 or 20 years, these machines have kind of popped up um, more and more because people have been finding them and refurbishing them and really taking a new interest in the craft. And that's how I learned was through Levi's. Uh, and then uh, some people that work on them at work at Levi's, like it's just their job. And some people really fall in love with these machines and get their own. So I was one of those people that decided I had to have one of these. And so I, I sourced a seller that does the refurbishing. He's in India and uh, yeah, it was sort of um, quite the process to obtain this old machine, get it refurbished, get the right table motor and everything set up. But now that I have it, it's definitely something that is um, going to be essential to my business. So it was a really awesome investment to make. Just want to get a little bit closer so you guys can really see. I'm going to lower this. So right now I already did this outline and I'm just going to go in and fill it with this um, fuzzy stitch.
But yeah, basically I just did that little X and it was really quick. And with the fuzzy stitch, I could be a little bit less accurate with the normal stitch. I kind of have to like go more so in circles over and over and over the same spots. But uh, yeah, I just thought, I know it's not something you guys can try at home, but I just thought it would be kind of a cool thing to show what this vintage machine does and what it's all about. And like I said, I'm, I'm at this store and the machine is permanently set up here now. So if you guys ever want to come and see me here and actually see the machine in person, get any embroidery work done or anything like that, you can definitely do so. Just reach out to me to make sure I'll be here that day. And I'd be happy to, to show anybody in person or meet anyone as well. So yeah, I think, I mean, that's everything I wanted to show you guys, but if anyone has other techniques that you want to have me just review quick, anything to do with distressing or fringing or anything with denim, you can definitely do that. I'd be interested in your fringing technique. Okay. Yeah. I'll hop back over here to the table. Just as a curiosity, um, I'm not in New York at the moment. What, how is the Bowery doing? Well, the store just opened um, mm -hmm. probably like um, two months ago. And yeah, I mean, it's definitely a hard time for retail. Like it's a little slower than what I'm used to, but I think there's still a decent flow of people. Honestly, I'm impressed with still how many people are out and about in New York. Like people say <laughs> that it's it's dead here, but I disagree. <laughs> so, and I, I was also there last week retail store, and um, yeah, we still have customers coming through. It's all about kind of attracting the right people to your location. I think if you have loyal people that love your brand or your store, then you're not going to suffer as much, but yeah. Um, let me set this up here. Let me tilt, tilt you guys back down. Okay, kind of got a little bit of a crazy mess here now, but okay, I'll use this pair to show. Um, so denim is you can pretty much use this technique to do horizontal or vertical. I wanna show the horizontal because I know I have a lot of people who wanna learn how to like fringe the bottom of their jeans. And this is like really cool way to do that, but it also applies to the horizontal as well. So the weave of the denim, you're gonna have the weft, which is the white threads that go across and then the warp, which is whatever it's the denim or it's the um, gray or black or whatever the jean is. And so what you really want to do to make sure that your fringes are going to come out right is make sure that you're staying on the grain of the weave. So making sure that none of your cuts are diagonal. So what I'm going to do is make a first cut here right on the edge, that one doesn't really matter. That's just like your initial cut because from there you're gonna find the grain and then you're gonna base the rest of your cuts off of that. So from there, um, let me see. Usually I use a seam ripper, something that has a nice point to it so you can pull, you can use a safety pin too, but you're gonna like pull at the edge there and then you can see some of the fibers start to pull out and as soon as you get to one of them that doesn't fall out that actually goes up like that one now you can see where that um, line is and that's the line you want to make sure to match every time you're making your next cut so what i like to do is pull out a few more of those because those are all gonna stay on. 
And that's really what you want to make sure of is that you're not pulling everything out. You want to make sure you still have some pieces that are staying on. Um, but from there, then I'm going to put it down on the table and I would just use a clear ruler and a piece of chalk. I like to use wax chalk because it irons out really easily, but I'm just going to take that clear ruler and match up the line that was created by pulling those fibers out and then make my next line in chalk. And then now I know where I'm gonna cut next. And that one, you can pretty much cut fearlessly because you know where it is. And it's gonna cut a few of the fibers, but it's gonna mostly be on the right track. And I'm not gonna go and make a bunch of lines and then cut all of them because I wanna make sure that every single cut I make is on the grain. And so in between every single one, I'm going to go and pull out those next fibers in the same way that I did it on the first one until I get the pieces that end up staying. And then now I can see exactly again where that line is to match for the next row. So again, I will come down here and I will just go in. And I think like a half inch is a pretty good guide. My, I make my next line a half inch over. And I would go in and cut that one and then same thing. So as you just keep going along, you're just continually checking that you're on that grain. And then if you do this method, you can create this cool fringe across the entire bottom of your jean, or you can take the band off the bottom of your jacket and do it on that. Um, and it's just like a really cool fluffy denim fringe is how it turns out. That's exactly how I did this jacket is I made sure when I was cutting these pieces out that I was staying as much on that grain as possible and then using that to guide my next cut. And then I, cu I cut actual sections out between those. So it wasn't like they're all next to each other, but you can see I have a strip of denim and then, and that's what I wanted to stay intact. So it's still connected fully at the top and the bottom. And then these are the pieces that came out from that. And then the rest that was just cut away. And if you're gonna do it, cause this is really easy to show too. If you're gonna do it horizontally, like you wanna make a really cool distressed rip in your jeans, uh, this is the same method. So what I would do if I was looking at the front of my jean and thinking like, oh, where do I want this cool rip to be? I would just stick a safety pin like randomly, like, oh, I want it to be there. I want that's where I want it to start. And then I would turn the jean inside out and look at where my safety pin ended up and use that as a guide. And I'm gonna cut my first line from the back of the fabric because it's hard to probably see here, but you can actually see the white weft threads mm -hmm. from the back of the jean. And so I just use this as a guide, but you're not gonna cut exactly where that line is. You're just gonna use that as the place mark for where you want your um, distressing to start. And then I'm just gonna clip a little bit. And now I can actually see those white threads so I can just cut in between them. I can just cut right in between two of the threads. And that's something you won't be able to fully see here. It's something you'll have to try on your own, but this is basically in between two threads them as much as I could possibly get it. And then from there, you can start to pull out on the top and the bottom of that cut. And you can see really how accurate you were. You can see that not too many of my white threads got cut away. So now I have a perfectly straight line that's in between the weft threads that I can use as a guide for the front of the fabric. So that's done from the inside. And then I would flip it right back to the outside. Don't need the safety pen anymore, take that out. And then from there, 
I would just go ahead and draw the shape of the distress mark that I want to do. So, you know, they're like kind of interesting shapes. So I might draw something like this to make it look like the ones you would find at the store. And then from there, I would just use this top line to go ahead and make all of my marks the same way I did with the fringe. I will make the next mark, cut it, pull out the threads, make the next mark, cut it, pull out the threads. And for this, a half inch is probably gonna be too thick because you wanna pull out all the threads so that it really is just the weft, the white threads that are left. So you will probably make like a quarter inch lines. Like that, you would just continue to make those lines all the way down. And like I said before, to make sure you're on the grain with every single cut, it's best to make that cut, pull some of the threads out to check it, then make the next line, then pull the threads out and check it. But um, if you just go in and do it this way, it's easy for, for you to pull out all of the work threads so that you just have the white ones left. I'm just going to go ahead and cut those so you can kind of see what that looks like. Yeah, you would have these pieces that then you just want to make sure that as many of the white threads stay connected from side to side as possible. And that's that's really the biggest mistake that is made when you're trying to distress is just cutting lines with willy nilly and then um, you end up cutting all those warp threads and you don't have any of them left because or weft threads because um, you were on the diagonal so it ended up cutting them. So yep, that's really just the, the key is just to stay um, in between those threads as much as possible and on grain. And then some of them will hang down, which looks pretty cool. But the majority of these threads, if you cut them properly, will come out as the white only once you've torn everything out. So yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. <laughs> Anything else, guys? Anything else anyone has questions about or wants to know? Okay. Anybody knows? Okay. Thank you. Nora, do you want to jump back in? Yeah. So how can people stay in touch with you? How can they follow you? And what's the best way to contact you? Yeah, I would say the best way to contact me if you have more questions or just like an inquiry would just be over email. But um, most directly, if you have like a quick question, you can just DM me. I'm really responsive. Um, but I don't know if you guys can see that. I'll put it somewhere else too. But my personal one is um, not on here. This is just the Untrend shop, which you can message me on that. That's totally fine. Um, that's the name of my shop is the name of the Instagram page. And that's pretty much where I post all of the products that I make. But on my personal one, I also post a lot of the in process stuff that I do and other like things I'm working on. I post a ton of stories on that one um, while I'm doing stuff while I'm working. So that's kind of a good way to follow what I'm up to as well. <laughs> um, but I can write them in the chat too. Cool. So at the Untrend shop and the personal one is? It's Ali Untrend. Ali Untrend. And your email is? The best one would be Ali Untrend at Gmail. Ali Untrend. I'll put that here. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also, like I said, I'm here at the Canvas, um, usually like three times a week. So. If you guys ever want to, if you're in the city and you want to come check it out or see my little studio set up here, um, yeah, just send me a message ahead of time to find out when I'm here. But uh, we're going to be offering the embroidery services to people who are coming to the store. 
So that's the idea of me being here. So if you guys wanna come physically say hello, that is cool too. Cool, well, thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your process and um, for telling us about the Untrend Shop. And as I said before, I'm Noor Bashara from Upcycle Design School. And you can check out upcycledesignschool.com and sign up for the Upcycle Design Masterclass and also check out the next workshop. So we're doing workshops every month. And I'm uh, not sure what the next one's going to be, but Cool. Thank you guys so much for joining. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks for being here and listening in. Appreciate it.